Uh, this is Everson Pearsall. I first wish to apologize for not being able to visit with you uh, at this time, but due to medical reasons, I find it difficult to make appointments in advance and be able to keep them. So I hope you will excuse me. The first thing I would like to do today is to define just who the Flying Taggers were and who they weren't. It seems that since the war, everyone who has said that he flew in China during World War II seems to be automatically a Flying Tiger, which is not true at all. However, when the Flying Tigers were asked to give up their flying as civilians, the 14th Air Force was being formed under the auspices of Washington, and uh, the Flying Tigers were really uh, uh, considered very important, and General uh, Chenault called a meeting of all of the Flying Tigers, about 100 in number, and uh, asked them to please stay and continue to fight for China, even though a brand new 14th Air Force was being uh, formed to uh, take the place of the Flying Tigers. After Chenault spoke, a a, a colonel from Washington by the name of uh, Clayton Bissell was introduced to say a few words to the Flying Tigers about uh, hoping they would stay and everyone uh, who would was going to be promised an automatic promotion and uh, an increase in salary. Colonel uh, uh, Bissell had been a World War I uh, fighter pilot, and he had uh, been an ace. He shot down five German planes. He was kind of a pompous officer. He liked to dress like the British officers did in the summertime. He even wore khaki shorts and he liked to carry a riding crop. And when he first arrived in China and was introduced to some of the flying tigers who were still active, uh, he uh, more or less resented the way they looked and acted. Of course, they were civilians. They weren't uh, in the service at that time. And they, uh, flying tigers, realized uh, his animosity and the way they dressed and so forth. They just tried to be comfortable. And they took exception, great exception, to uh, his acts of uh, not being satisfied with what he was seeing. And uh, so he got up to give a speech and then try and back Chenault on having them stay and fight for the new 14th Air Force, because having a 100 flying tigers to stay with their experience uh, and expertise would have been a tremendous help to the new pilots of the 14th Air Force coming from the United States. And when uh, Colonel Bissell got finished with his uh, speech, he said, and if you don't stay and fight Uh, for the new 14th Air Force. I will see that when you get back to the States, you are met by the draft board. Well, this was the the worst possible thing he could have said. And with that, all but seven of the Flying Tigers stood and left the room and started to make preparations to return to the state and to rejoin the Marines the Navy, and the Army Air Corps from whence they had come. I, uh, in the meantime, the war looked like it was getting close to me as a civilian, and I had been interested in flying ever since I was seven years old and uh, made um, models of airplanes, as many, many boys did. I tried to get into the Air Force, First, by going into New York and taking the pilot's physical examination before Pearl Harbor. Well, I was born with a heart murmur. 
but it never seemed to affect me while I was growing up. I was captain of the tennis team in school. I played right wing on the hockey team in the winter, and uh, I had no difficulty. I liked sports, I was active. I took the test, passed everything, but the last part of the test was where the doctor would put the stethoscope over your heart, check your heartbeat. And that's, of course, when they could hear that swish of my problem with my heart. And uh, I was uh, told that uh, I, I wouldn't be able to fly uh, because of my heart murmur. And I was very discouraged, and I went home. About six or eight months later, I, through a contact I had, I was able to arrange to go in again and try again. Believe it or not, when I walked in the room, who should I come face to face with but the same doctor that had examined me the previous time. And he said, haven't we met before? And I said, yes, sir. I was turned down six or eight months ago when I was here because of my heart murmur. At which time he said to me, son, you aren't going to fly for anyone's Air Force. And I was discouraged even more so. Then I tried the Navy, and the answer was the same. My big hope came uh, maybe uh, almost a year later when I happened to read in the New York Times that the Royal Canadian Air Force had uh, opened a, 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 an office in the Waldorf Astoria and were taking volunteers for uh, training in the Royal Canadian Air Force. So I hot-footed it into New York, I took their physical, and passed 100%. There was not even a mention of my heart murmur. And I think one of the reasons for that was the fact that at that time, we were into the war pretty much, uh, but we were getting licked everywhere we were fighting in the world. And like the RAF and the British found out early on in their fight, with the Germans the, uh, and the Japanese, there were many men fighting who were not perfect physical specimens and doing a fine job. And so uh, the Canadians were aware of that fact. But then two days later, after I had been accepted by the Canadians, I read an article in the Times again which said that the Congress of the United States had just passed a law forbidding any American boy to volunteer to fight even though he was going to do it for an ally. And I felt like saying, well, I tried, but you didn't want me. So I just, uh, everything I tried just didn't work. In the meantime, I became 4F in the draft, and then one day I was uh, told to report with all the other 4Fs for an, another physical. I went down to the McKinley School, walked in one door, 4F. 20 minutes later, I walked out another door, 1A. And uh, I really was upset because the advantage of volunteering is that you can pick the service you want. But when you're drafted, you can be put any place. And I was really upset at this time, but uh, I eventually uh, was sent down to Fort Dix, and uh, a couple of days later, a group of us were put on a train, which was headed south, but we didn't know where it was going. But on the afternoon of the day we got on, I uh, saw the first uh, officer on board, and he had the Air Force uh, wings on, and I knew at that time that I at least had been assigned to the Air Force, which was a step in the right direction. Uh, we ended up on the train ride in Biloxi, Mississippi, where we took our basic training. And we would go out on the field and learn to march and so forth. Terribly hot, 
Nobody liked the place. And after marching one afternoon, the captain uh, got up and, and gave a speech. I've forgotten what it was about. When he got finished, he said, are there any questions? Well, I raised my hand. He called on me, and I said, Captain, what is the quickest way to get out of here? And he said very quickly, volunteer as an aerial gunner. So I thanked him. The next morning, five of us went down to the medical department and said we wanted to take the physical for aerial gunnery school. And uh, we did. And when I had passed everything else and we got down to that point where I knew the doctor was going to put the stethoscope on me, uh, he was called to the telephone. His office was a short distance away. He apparently was late for a luncheon date with some friends, and he said, I'm running a little late, but I'll hurry it up, and I'll try to be there as soon as I can. And then he came out, and there were about four or five fellows ahead of me, and I kind of tried to slow them up because I wanted him to be even faster in his move. And uh, when it came my turn, he yelled, Next, I just kind of slowed, slowly walked up to him, he put the stethoscope on my heart and yelled, next, and I had passed. Well, two days later, uh, the five of us were put on a bus and taken down to the west coast of Florida, which had one of the two aerial gunnery schools in the country. The other one was in Harlingen, Texas, and uh, I learned to take machine guns apart and put them together and uh, after three months of training, uh, which included uh, going up in uh, a two-seater airplane and shooting at a tow target, uh, and as I said, after three months, uh, we graduated, and I became a three-stripe sergeant. Then we were assigned to a medium bomber group in... Uh, Louisiana, where the bomber group was training new pilots that were just getting out of flying school. Uh, they were flying in the B-26 Marauder, which was a very fast twin engine, medium bomber. And uh, we didn't have much to do, but it was recommended very highly that to get the feel of flying uh, particularly in the position which we uh, were going to have as a gunner, which in my case was a top turret gunner, it would pay to take rides in the airplane and get to know it because we were going to go to combat with it. So I would go down the flight line almost every morning and try and bum a ride because these new second lieutenants were going taken up as uh, co-pilots in this bomber and uh, I didn't have any trouble getting a ride, and uh, I rather enjoyed it until I got thinking one day, suppose the, the, there was a crew of six on this bomber. Uh, I said to myself, suppose one of the gunners can't shoot straight. Suppose uh, one of the pilots gets cold feet about something. Or the navigator can't navigate properly. It's going to be maybe six lives. I I would rather fly alone if possible, knowing that if I did something good, I would get the credit for it. And if I didn't, it would only be my problem and no one else's. So I went down to my squadron commander the next day, and I said to him, Captain, I would like to go to flying school and become a pilot, and I wondered if you would sponsor me. He never said a word. He opened his dress, desk drawer and took out my file and looked at it and then looked up at me and said, Pearsall, you're an eager beaver. You have more time flying in these bombers than any five other gunners in the group. I'd be glad to sponsor you. He said, you should be prepared to meet before a board of five pilots in two or three days. 
and uh, I wish you luck. And he got up and shook my hand. So I went down uh, to uh, a hangar a few days later and walked in. I was scared to death. And here were five pilots. I think it was a major, two captains, and uh, two lieutenants. And they had copies of my uh, file. And they started by asking me questions about my family and what I had done as a young boy and growing up. And it, I'd say it lasted about 20 or 20, 25 or 30 minutes. Then I was excused and told that I would hear the result in two or three days. So I left. And the very next day, I got word from my squadron commander that he wanted to see me. And I immediately went down and uh, walked into his office. And he immediately got up from his desk and came towards me with his hand outstretched. And I knew I'd made it then. And he congratulated me and said that uh, I should be prepared to leave uh, within a few days and that I would probably have to take a physical before I left. Well, that bothered me again, but I couldn't do anything about it. So I thanked him. And uh, the day I was to leave, I, I was called in the medical department and uh, this very nice captain uh, checked my heart. I said, you, you've got a heart murmur. That I know you realize it. And he said, I, I'm not going to be the one responsible for keeping you from uh, going to flight school if that is the way it's going to work. So I wish you good luck. And I thanked him very, very much. So I was sent down to San Antonio, where I expected to start my ground school towards pilot training. And I had another physical, and they found the heart murmur, of course. But this time, they sent me over to Kelly Field, a very old and highly respected Army Air Corps field that had been there for years. And for two days, they gave me every heart examination known to man, including put me to, putting me to sleep and checking my heart. And the uh, day after, uh, they came into the big barracks I was in. I had the only bed out of 60. And this major came in the door and walked up to the foot of my bed and said, Pearsall, you've got a heart murmur, but we think you're going to be all right and I wish you luck. And I, I admit I started to cry. I, I was so elated. After what I'd been through, I said, Major, will the uh, report uh, that uh, I've just had be a part of my medical file? He said, absolutely, and he wished me luck. And I started ground school. Well, I was successful. I think it was 10 and a half months or something like that. And I uh, graduated. And uh, then I was sent to fighter school in Florida for three months. And we all thought that at the end of that time, we would be sent to Europe for combat. Well, we were half right, because the half of the uh, training squadron was sent to uh, England, but the other half, to which I was a part, uh, was sent to uh, Mississippi for training as tactical reconnaissance pilot. Well, I didn't know what a tactical reconnaissance pilot was, but I found out very quickly they flew the fastest fighters just as the fighter boys did. But there were differences in uh, the training. In fighters, we flew rather high and uh, would go up and practice shooting at the targets at 24, 25,000 feet. Uh, at tactical reconnaissance, 
we would very seldom fly over 100 feet above the ground if the terrain would allow it. But we flew the same planes, which uh, made me feel good. The tactical reconnaissance training took about the same time the fighter training took, about three months. And uh, at the end of that time, I was put in a pilot pool down in Georgia with two of my friends, and pilots were waiting there, pilots with different classifications, until they were called to assign to a certain squadron somewhere in the world. And it wasn't long before the three of us were uh, taken down to Miami, and we got on board this four-engine transport plane, and we headed due south. And we got uh, to the uh, north part of uh, Brazil, and then the next morning we left to fly across the South Atlantic to Africa and the Gold Coast. And we uh, flew across the entire length of the Sahara Desert. Uh, I was amazed at the clarity. Sudan, uh, where the uh, Suez Canal began, stayed overnight and then flew to Aden, Arabia, and then turned north and flew to Calcutta. And we got off at Calcutta and we stayed at the British American Officers Club uh, for a couple of nights. And then we were put in a jeep and driven uh, to uh, a, a field, airfield, 90 miles above uh, Calcutta. But I have omitted the fact that, uh, oh no, when we, when we arrived there, they, they weren't doing very much. They were waiting for General Chennault to invite us up to uh, China to start uh, flying missions. And he had provided 18 brand new Curtis P-40s to my new squadron. And uh, we were told a couple of days after I arrived that we would each have to take an Indian cholera and Indian typhus shot. Well, I must have gotten a bad needle in one of them because three days later, they carried me into the station hospital on a stretcher and I spent the next 53 days trying to win my battle over hepatitis, which we called uh, yellow jaundice. Uh, the whites of your eyes became yellow. Your skin had a light shade of yellow. It was a liver disease. And the form that I had, the liver would either elect to fight its way out of this terrible disease, or it wouldn't. And they told me that the first sign of uh, uh, help would be my desire to have anything sweet, like candy. And the nurses would make me pans of fudge and then cut it in nice little squares. But when they brought it in front of me, I went at it with both hands I couldn't wait to get it in my mouth. And anyway, I slowly started to get my strength back. And after 53 days, as I've said, I was released from the hospital. Uh, I must, they had a mirror in the men's room. Why they did that, I'll never know. I looked worse than some released prisoners of war that I saw pictures of but I felt my strength was coming back. So they put me in a transport with some Chinese troops and flew me over the uh, Himalaya mountain range, and I landed at Kunming, which was a northern terminus for those flying from India to China. I was met by our executive officer who was going to take me out to where the squadron had been flying missions for some time while I was in the hospital. He took one look at me and said, Pearsall, 
you'd make a heck of a ad for vitamin pills. And that name vitamin has stuck with me all these years for anyone who knew me in China. And it was a blessing in disguise because I found out after I rejoined the squadron that practically every pilot had a nickname. And it became useful when we were flying missions over enemy territory because uh, sometimes the Japanese would try to home in on our radio frequency to pick up any names they might be able to listen to. And uh, you'd be amazed at what information they could get, particularly if the individual was shot down later and captured uh, our parachutes all had our names on them. And uh, so no one um, minded in over enemy territory using in radio in our airplanes, we always used everyone's nickname. They never heard the name Pearsall, but they heard vitamin plenty of times, I'm sure. Uh, when I, uh, the executive officer arrived uh, and took a look at me. Uh, he said, I can't take you back to the base looking like that. Pierce always said, I'm going to send you to rest camp for a week. So he did, and I didn't do anything but eat and sleep and just relax there. I don't know if it did me any particular good, but it didn't hurt. Then he came at the end of a week, picked me up. We flew back out to a place called Quail Inn, which was... Uh, the one of the original fields that the original Flying Tigers flew from had a tremendous cave alongside of it, which uh, was used uh, to advantage uh, by anyone who served there because they had all the radio equipment and other things in there which were protected. I again reported to the uh, commander of... Uh, my squadron, Major McComas, and he told me to be prepared to fly my first mission in about four days. So I was assigned to uh, barracks, and, and uh, it occurred to me at that time that I hadn't flown in quite a while. And uh, these airplanes we were flying had 85 instruments in the cockpit. And uh, while you certainly didn't use every one when you flew, you better know where they were in case of an emergency. So I went down the next morning. I found out which plane was assigned to me, and I climbed in the cockpit, and I just sat there, and I looked at those instruments for an hour. And I would try to memorize where they were and so forth. And I went back the second day and did the same thing. But I found that starting the airplane was going to be one of the most difficult things for me because it, it took a little skill. If you weren't careful, you'd get a lot of flame coming out of the uh, smokestacks uh, on the, either side of the nose, and uh, that could be uh, very dangerous if it got out of control. So I called my crew chief and told him that uh, when uh, I came to fly my first mission, I would like him on the wing and uh, have him advise me of starting the engine. And he said, don't worry, I'll be there. New pilots in every squadron had to fly what were called tail end Charlie. That was the last position in the flight of airplanes. It was, um, therefore, the most dangerous position to have to fly in because I remember distinctly three brand-new pilots flying that position after I had been over there flying a while were killed when Japanese fighters pulled up behind them and blasted them, and not a word was said. Uh, and all of a sudden, one of the boys would say, uh, where's Pearsall? He was here a minute ago. And uh, I remembered to be very careful and look around while I was up there. So the fourth day came and we had a mission 
And uh, at the briefing by the intelligence people, we were supposed to go down to this rather good-sized river where intelligence had reported that a large number of Japanese infantry were crossing this river in barges and boats of all kind. And uh, we were to strafe as many as we could. So the flight leader gave the signal to start engines, and I had my crew chief there on the wing, started the engine okay, and then uh, finally came my turn to taxi out, and things started to come back real quickly. I finally took off as the last one, and I was a little slow in uh, getting into formation, and the... uh, uh, leader of the flight called on the radio and said, Pierce Hall, let's tighten it up a little, uh, which I did. Well, when we got down to this river, I had never seen a sight quite like it. These infantry uh, soldiers, Japanese soldiers, were f- overcrowded in some of these uh, barges that they were going across in, and they had a full complement of weapons, probably carrying around 70, 80 pounds of equipment, including their rifles. And when they saw us, some of them went over the side of the barge and tried to hang on, thinking they would make it less of a target. And they hadn't figured the weight of their extra paraphernalia, and some of them drowned. Well, anyway, we had a shooting spree that day, the like of which I, I don't remember anywhere else. We just couldn't miss, and we slaughtered many of them, except those who had gotten across and were able to take protection. Uh, So when our ammunition was out, we had nothing to do but fly home. We were under instructions on any mission. When we were over enemy territory and we were either low on gas or low on ammunition, we would head for home immediately. So we got back, and uh, we went in to the intelligence people to be debriefed. Then uh, I went back to my barracks and was immediately tossed in a shower with my clothes on and everything, which was uh, the thing that was done to all pilots who just completed their first mission. So... uh, I had mission number one at that time. Uh, I would like at this time to tell uh, about the Japanese uh, fighters. Chenault had mentioned to us when we arrived to every new group of pilots, these Japanese fighters are so more agile than your our fighters that you've got to be very careful that you don't try and stay and dogfight with them because they'll turn right around and get on your tail and shoot you down. You should try and get above them if you can and then dive on them as fast as you can and go back up to get the altitude advantage again. And that was very, very good advice. My first look at Japanese fighters was one day when we were attacking their airfield and they had gotten a little notice that we were getting close. And I saw them hanging in the air in such an angle I couldn't believe they were climbing so fast. But the reason they were agile and the reason they could turn and and, uh, climb fast was the fact that they were much lighter than our fighters. The Japanese had no self-sealing fuel tanks. They had no armor plating for the part of the pilots or any other part of the airplane. Whereas we had uh, uh, some armor around us in the cockpit. We had self-sealing gas tanks. As a result of the increased uh, weight, we could outdive them with ease when we had to. One day, uh, I was on a mission with our squadron commander, Major McComas, and we went up on the Yangtze River to uh, uh, shoot up a Japanese airfield. And they got, we got in a big fight, 
and a lot of, uh, of our pilots were separated, including our CO, Major McComas, found himself all alone. So rather than hang around, he remembered another Jap field down the river and went down there alone and uh, was going in to strafe when he noticed that planes were taking off. He pulled up behind two of them, which were only 50 feet in the air. He blasted one of them. It flipped over and went into the second one. That, that was two gone. He kept flying and came up behind two others that had taken off a little before and blasted both of them, that's four, and went further yet uh, with the extra speed he had, came up behind one of them and shot that down for five. No one ever did that in China before or after we were there. When he got back to the field, of course, he reported it Chenault heard about it, and the next day a brand new P-51D model with the bubble canopy was flown into our field with uh, the Major's name on it, and we all cheered, and Major was extremely happy. The only one to ever shoot down five in one day. Uh, we're awakened every morning at 6 a.m. by Chinese houseboys, and uh, then we would walk up to the mess hall for breakfast. And if we were not on uh, flying duty, we would uh, have most of the day to ourselves, but uh, we would go in for the briefing for the pilots who were on the, a mission, and then we would go out to the flight line and watch them take off and uh, find the approximate time they might should be returning and we'd go down again and count the ones as they came in to see if there were any missing. That was kind of standard procedure. We uh, were never attacked in the daytime. I flew my 81 missions from five different airfields because uh, when we would get to an airfield and start creating problems, for the Japanese, they would send ground troops in, and we would have to leave and go to another field. But uh, they did attack at night, almost every night. They would come in around 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, either one or two bombers, drop a couple of bombs, and then uh, disappear. And they... Uh, Tokyo Rose admitted one time on the radio that they only did it to keep us from sleeping because we would hear the sound of those engines while we were in bed. And when we did, we'd hot foot it out and go into slit trenches, which we had put all around the field. Once in a while, they would do some damage, but not too often. Uh, one... Uh, Day we, I was put on a mission from uh, this field we happened to be flying at at the time called Sichuan, Sichuan, and it was a long way to Shanghai, and uh, so long that we had to stop halfway there to an old abandoned airfield and top off our gas, and we didn't have enough gas for two uh, wing tanks, only one, 80 gallons each. So we landed there, and our uh, ground crew was already there and uncovered these cans of fuel from the, a lot of dirt, and they, we found out that they were in two-gallon cans. Well, that slowed the whole works up, and uh, we... Uh, had to uh, run the gasoline through with chamois cloth so there'd be no dirt to get into the fuel tanks. But we finally got extra gas to make up for that that we'd use flying up there, and we were on our way to Shanghai. We came down over this 10,000-foot mountain range a little north of Shanghai, and we're going pretty fast. And on the first pass, 
uh, Roy Christensen got hit on the rear end of his plane and the whole rear end took fire and it also flipped him over on his back about 25 or 30 feet above the runway and everybody yelled, Chris, you're on your back. Roll it over and pull up, which he did. And he eventually bailed out at the far extreme of the airfield in uh, a uh, area where there were corn corns uh, stacks lined up. It looked like inverted ice cream cones. The corn had been removed from these stalks, and then they made a, a pyramid. And uh, he no sooner hit the ground, the Chinese came out of nowhere and put him in one of these things and told him to stay there till dark, they'd be back. He could look out, but he, he couldn't be seen from the outside. And there were many of them, fortunately. About 20 minutes later, he looked out, and he sees Jap infantrymen coming through with um, bayonets. And every once in a while, they would shove a bayonet into one of these things. But fortunately, they didn't do it to his. Sure enough, a nightfall came. The Chinese showed up. And two and a half months later, Roy Christensen walked back into our airport. He was a great guy, very popular, everyone liked him. And we were happy that he was, uh, we, we did lose a couple of other boys. And uh, that day, a 30 caliber rifle shot came into my, canop uh, into my cockpit and went past my left ear about two inches away and embedded itself in the radio behind my armor plating. Then I heard a loud pop, and I looked out to the right of my airplane and saw that the three 50-caliber machine guns on the right wing had been knocked into a 45-degree angle, and it affected the yaw of, of the airplane, which I had to allow for. I was afraid that I may have received other damage, so I started for home, Another one of our pilots uh, was on the way home, pulled in close to me, and I asked him if he would fly under me and check my aircraft. And he did and said he didn't see anything uh, wrong, but uh, I was concerned more about the landing, if he flattened the tires or did anything to the landing gear. So we started home, and... Uh, I called in for an emergency landing just to make sure. And as it turned out, I came in high in case I saw my uh, fuel indicator on E. But I landed safely. I taxied to the uh, flight line, parked the airplane, and went in to be debriefed by the intelligence boys. And as I was leaving, my crew chief came in to me and said, uh, Lieutenant, I thought you'd like to know you landed with six gallons of gasoline. In a P-51, that was equivalent to six minutes. We burned about a gallon a minute at cruising speed. And that really scared me, but it, I got away with it. So I proceeded to go out on the line to watch the other, some of the other planes come in. And in a period of 10 minutes, I saw two of my friends land on the runway. Their engines cut out. They were out of gas. They couldn't even taxi off the runway. And we thought, that's cutting things a little close. But they both got away with it. <clears throat> Next, uh, I guess one of the most dangerous missions I flew occurred when four of us went down to Hong Kong Harbor, which was one of our favorite targets. And uh, we completed our mission. We're on our way home when uh, my engine started to act up, act up, and I had my head down in the cockpit trying to find out what was wrong when I happened to look to my left, and here were cannon shells and machine gun uh, tracers going just by the left of my wing, and I looked back, and here was a Japanese fighter about 75 yards in back of me, and he just, his airplane was lit up like a Christmas tree. And he was letting me have everything he had, and he never touched me. 
Well, the minute I saw him, I started to do everything I could think of to make my airplane harder to hit. When you were in flight training, you were told never to cross control. You didn't push the stick to the right and then push the left rudder pedal. Well, I did that. And that gives you an idea of you're going one way, but you're actually going another. And uh, the problem was that I was only 15 feet, 1,500 feet above the ground. And uh, I, I couldn't believe it, but when I turned around again, the Jap had turned around and headed back towards the harbor. And he, he would have had me. I, I Here I am of the bum engine and the low altitude. I couldn't dive out away from him. And uh, I was so incensed at being caught that way that I turned around and started to chase him. And uh, I got uh, even, I don't think he expected it because he wasn't going too fast. I eventually just got close enough. I gave him a long burst. And I must have hit him a few times because he turned around right away and came back at me right underneath. I don't think he passed 30 feet below my airplane. He looked up at me, and I saw him with these goggles down, and I looked down at him. In the meantime, I had called my three buddies who had gone up higher and kept going, and I saw them turn and come back, and they were coming real fast. And uh, the flight leader... Then the, the Jap turned again and went back for the harbor, and uh, I couldn't get near him this time. But uh, the flight leader pulled up behind him and gave him a real burst, hit in the cockpit area first and then the back of the engine, and he must have been killed with the first burst because the airplane just gradually started to go down. Uh, if he'd been in control over it, it would have turned to right or left and evasive action. And then the uh, smoke on the engine turned to flame, and the four of us pulled up behind him and followed him, and there was a big lake ahead of us. And I never thought he'd get across the lake, but he just made it to the other side and hit at the bottom of a huge pine tree. And it was as though the plane went right up pine tree and set the whole tree on fire. Would have made a beautiful Christmas display. Well, we turned for home congratulated the flight leader, who was a great guy. Why the Jap pilot didn't hit me, I will never know. If it had been reverse, I would have hit him so hard. But he, I think he thought I was going faster than I was, and he led me more than he should have, close to his life anyway. Uh, when I had about 45 missions, Five other pilots who about, had about the same number and I were sent down to India in a transport plane. And we had a little R&R, &R, stayed at the British American Officers Club for a few days and, and uh, had some pretty good food and enjoyed ourselves. And then we went over to an old RAF airfield in Calcutta called Dum Dum airfield, and there we picked up six brand new P-51Ds with the bubble canopy, which we had never flown before, and we uh, headed out to fly over the hump into China. Now, when you flew over the Himalaya mountain chain, it was the most awesome group of mountains I ever saw from the air. You had to be at least 22,000 feet to get over the lowest portion, and that meant you had to be on oxygen. So we're roaring across in these brand new airplanes and we're really moving. I happened to look to my left and I saw this black piece of coal, huge. There, were, there was a, nothing, a blanket, a white cloud about 2,000 feet below us. And I looked at this thing coming up through the clouds and then realized I was looking at uh, Mount Everest on the dark side. The other side had snow on it, and I called it to the attention of the other pilots. Nobody had a camera. And uh, just seeing that tremendous thing uh, just, just was wonderful. So we arrived safely in Kunming, 
And when we got there, we were told that we had flown uh, uh, south to north uh, route faster than it had ever been flown before. And uh, then we stopped, had lunch, and then flew, flew out to, uh, to our field with these new planes. All the other pilots crowded around and were delighted to see them. We were glad to get there. Then uh, one day, uh, the uh, operations officer came into my tent. We were in another field now. And uh, he said, uh, we're sending a big mission up to Hankow on the Yangtze River. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Older is coming down from headquarters to lead the whole mission. And I want you to fly his wing. Every flight leader had a wingman, and the wingman's main job was to protect the flight leader if he needed help in case of a fight. And uh, this uh, colonel at the time was the ranking ace in China. He had been a, a flying tiger and was a terrific pilot. And I said to the operator, are you sure you want me to do this? He said, you can handle it. So the day came, and uh, we went in for the briefing. The Chinese had, or Japanese had five airfields up there, and we were assigned to attack one of them and shoot up as many planes as we could. So I met the colonel. Time came to get in our airplanes. He gave the wind-up signal. Engine started, and off we went. We had no sooner crossed the river up there than a Jap fighter pulled up in front of us and the colonel gave it a real blast and it started to smoke a little, the engine, when the pilot flew directly into a cloud bank and we lost sight of him. But I happened to look back about 20 seconds later and I saw him come out of that cloud bank straight down with his full engine all of his engine on fire, and he hit the ground and it just exploded. So we strafed the field a couple of times and uh, headed for home. And when we uh, got in for the uh, debrief of the intelligent people, uh, our uh, intelligence officer asked the colonel if he had anything to report. And Colonel Older said, well, when we first got up there, I had a nice shot at a, at a fighter, but he flew into a cloud bank and I never saw him again. And I spoke up and I said, I saw him. I looked back and saw him come out of that cloud bank and crash and blow up. And I said, I'd be glad to uh, confirm that uh, kill for the colonel. The colonel looked over at me and smiled. I don't know which one uh, that was because he ended up with 18 and a half. At this time, I think I should say more about Colonel Older. As I said, he had been a flying tiger. He had graduated from UCLA. And uh, after the war, he went back to UCLA, got a law degree, eventually became a partner in a law firm in L.A. And uh, later on, Ronald Reagan appointed him as a Superior Court judge. And guess what? case he was handed, the Manson trial, those young killers that invaded that home and killed about five people. And when they heard who the judge was that was assigned to the case, they threatened him in every way possible. Uh, they were going to cut him up in pieces and do this and do that. Uh, not long after one of the reunions I went to, I talked to a friend of the colonel's. He said the people don't realize it, but every day he went into that courtroom, he had a snub nose 38 under his belt. And I thought that was interesting. Uh, as I had mentioned, uh, I, before I completed my last mission, I flew out of five different airfields thanks to the Japanese infantry. We had one tragic story that I'm going to tell you. The game of choice in our squadron was blackjack, and there were numerous games of blackjack going on every night because nobody had anything else to do. 
And one night, this boy who was the dealer in this particular game won $25 from another of our pilots. And he didn't have the money to pay the dealer at the time, but payday was only two days away and the dealer wasn't worried about collecting it. The problem arose the next morning when the boy who owed the $25 was shot down and killed. The boy that was owed the money then went in that afternoon to our finance office and filed a claim for $25 against the boy's estate. Well, that got around the field like wildfire. People wouldn't talk to him. Four of us went down to the operations officer and said, we don't want to fly with him. We can't trust him. Well, he got the word real quick and went down the next morning and canceled the claim. But the damage was done. Uh, he never came to any of our reunions after the war, and that was just as well. But it was a terrible thing. Losing the, the boy uh, was bad enough, but then to have the other one do what he did was terrible. Well, at the end of, uh, of uh, my, near the end, which I didn't know, I uh, had just returned from a volunteer mission that I'd been asked to fly, making a mission number 81. And uh, when I got back, uh, the uh, operations officer said to me, Pearsall, you, you uh, have just become a flight leader. Your captaincy is a week and a half away. And I felt really good about that. I had joined as a buck private. And uh, then he said, but there's a brand new thing out called the point system. And he said, you get a certain number of points for the time overseas, number of points for, this is for pilots. For every mission you've flown, more points for every important medal that you may have won. And he said, you have far than enough to go home tomorrow morning. And I thought he was joking. I said, come on. He said, no, I'm telling you the truth. This just came out today. He said, three of your friends have uh, agreed to go. I said, I want some time to think it over. He said, take all you want. At the end of 30 minutes, I went down to his office and walked in. I said, I think you better get me on that plane. As I said I, earlier, I remembered three new pilots who got shot down on their first mission, and anything could happen. I had been terribly lucky to this state, and uh, we got on a plane and flew to the rear area where we waited for our orders to be cut, and then we flew down to uh, Calcutta, stayed at the British American Officers Club again, and about the third or fourth day, we boarded this troop ship and uh, started down the, the, uh, har out of the harbor at Calcutta. And on the very first day was August the 1st, 1945. The captain came on and said, now hear this. We have dropped an atom bomb on uh, Hiroshima. Well, we didn't know what an atom bomb was. Three days later, he came on again and said the same thing, but this time we dropped the second one on Nagasaki. As I recall, sometime between the 19th and 21st of August, as we were on our way home on the boat, the Japs surrendered, unconditional. We uh, went through the Suez Canal. We got out on the uh, Mediterranean, and uh, one night at 3 o'clock in the morning, we went past the rock of Gibraltar in fog so thick you couldn't see 10 feet in front of you. And the uh, sound of that foghorn all night long <laughs> kept everyone from sleeping. But the next day was beautiful and we started northeast towards the good old US of A. And after 28 days, we arrived at Pier 16 on uh, that island. Not, it's in New Jersey, got on a train and were taken to uh, Camp Kilmer, 
overnight. The next morning, the other three boys had to go on. One lived in Pennsylvania. The other lived in Seattle, Washington. I don't know if I can remember where the third one had to go. But I was taken in a, in a uh, jeep to uh, Fort Dix where I got my uh, papers and called a friend of mine in Westfield and asked him if he could come down and pick me up. And he said he'd be happy to. So an hour, 15 minutes later, I was back home again. Uh, I would uh, like to take this opportunity now that I have come to the end of my little talk to uh, thank Bob Miller and Lou France for helping me today with this uh, recording. They have been wonderful, and particularly Bob that I've worked with for a month has been very, very helpful, and I thank them both very much and to the members of the Westfield Historical Society. A very Merry Christmas, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity to uh, appear before you this way.